it's fun because I just don't think there's another piece of clothing or fashion where you can make as much of a statement with wearable art like you can with shoes. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. In this episode, we're going to look at the growing world of custom sneakers. Our guest is sneaker artist Dylan DeJesus. Thank you for joining us. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. So what is it about shoes? What is it about them that got your attention? Being a Chicago guy like myself, you know, the Jordan basketball sports were just a part of the culture. And when I was in high school is when I really got into just collecting sneakers, just a love for sneakers. When I sort of got that first job in high school, started to finally, you know, make a little bit of money for yourself. What do you want to spend it on? And for me, it was just on shoes. It was collecting rare shoes and staying up to date on you know, what was coming out. And this was just such a a fun time in my life because this is really before social media became what it is now. And this is still in like the blog era. Yeah, the original. places, yeah, places like Nike Talk and forums. And um, there's just none of that nowadays. It's just not the same. And we're just so inundated with so many constant updates and stuff. But before you used to have to, looking at things like magazines and and all of this other stuff. And um, so it's just such a, a, a fond time in my life looking back on when I really got into sneakers. And uh, that's sort of how I landed here, just a love for it. I went to college to study architecture, started taking some painting classes in college. And um, I said, you know what? I see some people online doing this whole painting shoe thing to make something rare, you know, make something one of one for themselves. And I said, you know what? I've taken a couple painting classes. Let's see what I can do if I throw some paint at some shoes. Now, is a shoe is a shoe a hard thing to kind of customize or is it pretty easy? Like when you look at painting other kinds of mediums, is a shoe easy or is it difficult to do? Shoes are a pretty tricky canvas in and of themselves because there's a lot of different materials As much as you might think it's an entirely blank canvas, it's not because certain materials really shouldn't be painted. Certain parts of shoes you have to treat differently. And so I do think that, you know, they are, they take some know-how to really do them well. But at the same time, it's fun because I just don't think there's another piece of clothing or fashion where you can make as much of a statement with wearable art like you can with shoes. Is that really the attraction, you think, is the idea of kind of, you can customize this, it's wearable art? Is that what gets people into it? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, there's a lot of people like myself who just have a general love for shoes and custom sneakers have really started to become a part of the culture within the sneaker industry over the last decade or so. And so now, even if you have no interest in custom shoes, just paying attention to you know, um, some of the, you know, current sneaker blogs, however they're ran nowadays, you still end up seeing some of this stuff. You still start to see certain sneaker customizers who have really implanted themselves as figures within the industry. So anybody who's, you know, really into shoes has certainly at least heard about it. And so I think that that's why a lot of people do tend to want to get started to create something one of one for themselves so that they can stand out from the crowd. What was the first shoe you did? Do you remember? Yeah. So the first shoe that I did would be a shoe that was inspired by uh, the South Beach LeBrons. So LeBron went to Miami in 2010. And shortly after that, uh, he would have been on his eighth Nike basketball sneaker. They released a colorway called the South Beach colorway with him going to Miami. And it was inspired by, you know, the Miami Vice show. So it was teal and hot pink. And um, it was a really rare exclusive shoe. And being a broke college student at the time, I couldn't afford to get the shoes. But in the early days of custom sneakers, what people were doing was taking colorways like the South Beach LeBron and painting them onto simpler, cheaper models so that you could essentially have something that was meant to symbolize that more rare or exclusive pair. So that's how I got started. And that's really what custom sneaker was, you know, the the entire industry for the first few years of me doing it. There was definitely people who were creating your theme shoes, your Iron Man shoes, you know, your Hulk shoes, but that was way, way, way less common than it is nowadays. Originally, it was about recreating other colorways from more exclusive shoes 
onto cheaper, easier to find Nike models. But could people like know? Would would people be able to tell? Like, hey man, like I know you just kind of you painted those. Totally. Those aren't the real ones. Totally, totally. Yeah, I mean, you know, we would do a LeBron shoe, which is very much it looks like an on court basketball sneaker, and paint that onto a Jordan. And as, as weird as it is. Jordan shoes almost they don't look anywhere near what the last 20 years of on court basketball sneakers look like. Like if you just compare the look of Jordan shoes, his first uh, 20 sneaker models to LeBron, who's coming up on his 20th sneaker model, there's not a they don't look anything alike. Just the technology and stuff has advanced so much. So that's why, you know, people could certainly spot it. But at the same time, it was, oh, that's really cool. You were trying to recreate that very rare colorway and uh, do it on a simpler shoe, you know? So how pop, okay, I know this is kind of a hard thing to like gauge, right? But how popular would you say this is, right? So 100% of people own shoes, 10% are doing customized, 20%, like 1%. Like how, how popular would you say that it is? Of all people that are into shoes, I would say less than 5%. Yeah. I mean, somewhere between 1% to 5%. Not a not a huge minority or a huge it, majority, excuse me. But enough that it's still like on the grand scale extrapolated throughout the nation. Like there's still a lot of people. Definitely. Definitely. There still is. And like I said, you can't help but if you follow sneaker pages that post sneaker relay states and sneaker news and this type of stuff, you can't help but see it and come across it, especially because it's just really popular within, you know, um, sports athletes are wearing custom shoes on NBA courts on NFL fields. And so more and more people are just hearing about it. But I can still walk down the street into the grocery store, have a conversation with somebody. What do you do? Nine, 95 out of 100 times they would, you know, they would, unless they are into shoes, say, painting on shoes, that's a thing. People make a career out of that. You know what I mean? Um, and I've been doing it a long time. And they're still, you know, if I'm just in an Uber with somebody and you, you, you're talking back and forth with your driver, there's a good chance they probably never heard of people painting on shoes. So do most people do it as a hobby or is this kind of a, what's the word that I'm looking for? A business for most people or a little bit of both? A little bit of both. I think it's something that has to start as a hobby, of course, because it takes a while, like, like a lot of things, I'm sure it takes a while to really conquer and master. And unfortunately for a lot of artists, I think it takes a long time to turn it into a business. I think it can be hard to turn it into something profitable. And there's a sort of a big picture narrative, I think, going on within the industry that somebody might take a look at something like this um, and just see an Air Force One, okay? Now, an Air Force One is a shoe that for many, many years has been $100, okay? So when they see this, regardless of what's on here, that's a $100 shoe. So to then convince somebody to pay $1,000 for it, $2,000 for it, or even a couple hundred, they can't help but have that price point in their head of, oh, well, that was just originally a $100 shoe. They're not really, it's starting to change, um, but not as many people are able to really just view it as an art piece. You know, if you were purchasing a, a canvas from somebody like I have here of one of uh, a Chicago artist did of my wife, you're not asking how much the canvas cost. You know what I mean? You're not, you know, if Picasso paints on a piece of paper, you're not wondering how much you paid for the piece of paper. You have a Picasso piece in front of you. You know what I mean? Um, so I think that that's a narrative that myself and others have really tried to help shift within the industry over the last half decade or so. Um, it, it takes a while to make money doing this so that you can push past people just thinking of it as, okay, that's a $100 shoe. It's a little bit cooler than what I could purchase at the mall if they were to release a uh, you know, a special limited edition colorway, but I can't pay 10 times the normal price for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if this question will make sense because I don't really know anything about art, but hopefully it'll kind of like, you'll get the gist of what I'm asking. Do you think that like sneaker art, can it raise to the level of high art where it's like saying something about society or about relationships or about whatever, you know, like you look at a painting and you feel a certain way about something. Can sneakers do that or is it at the level of like, oh, 
that looks cool. Totally. No, I, I really think they can. And over the last few years, there's been more opportunities for people within my industry of of popping up in different galleries in certain galleries, celebrating the history of custom sneakers, having an entire installations dedicated to just artists from all around the world. And so the more that we can be seen as not just shoes, but art, the better for everybody. And that's where I think you'll really start to see more and more people who aren't just into, you know, collecting shoes and wanted to have a rare exclusive colorway, but people have been artists their whole lives working on shoes to tell their story for the first time. And that's happening more and more, I think. So kind of like getting into the process of it, like how, sure. how do you do it <laughs> essentially, yeah. right? Yeah. So everybody's process is different. You know what I mean? I think one of my big picture goals as an artist um, is to really be able to tackle anything that comes my way. So around the same time that I really got started with shoes, funny enough, I feel like I owe my entire artistic journey to a TV show called Ink Master. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's yeah, a tattoo, tattoo competition. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so that started around the time when I had been doing this maybe a year or so. I think it, it premiered maybe 2011, 2012. And I feel I learned more about the things that I implement every single day than truly anything in life, as crazy as that sounds, the impact that that show has had on me. And it's so funny because what I really enjoyed about the show is, uh, you know, they would start with maybe 15 to 20 people and week by week artists would get eliminated until, you know, there was a big showdown with the final three. And so as somebody who watched the show as it aired, you would see the premiere episode with 20 people. And right away, I would watch it with uh, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, little brother. And we would pick which artist we thought really stood out in the beginning. And I think that that person can go all the way and look at what he did on day one. And let's check him out on Instagram and see what he's been doing. And it's so funny because I think we watched, you know, I, I have no idea what season they're even on now. I think 12 or 13 or something. Never once did I come close to predicting correctly because I would always pick the artist on day one that I think would win who was the strongest at their own style. And so you would have absolutely incredible new school artist or absolutely incredible traditional black and gray who just, wow, the piece that they did would blow you away. But as the weeks would go by and there would be new challenges, that black and gray tattoo artist, then when the competition's halfway done, would all of a sudden have to do a comic book style tattoo or a new school tattoo and do something he's not that familiar with. And all of a sudden that artist who I'd been rooting for, who I thought was going to go all the way because he was knocking out the first few challenges when he got to do his thing, would get eliminated and what I started to take away after a few seasons and what the judges would say as well on the tattoo show is you need to be able to handle any tattoo that comes in your shop. So over time, as I was trying to develop a, a style as an artist, because I'm not a formally trained artist by any means, I realized I want to be able to handle anything that comes my way and put my stamp on it. I don't ever want to have to turn somebody away because I don't have the ability to do it. I don't want somebody who maybe wants a portrait uh, to not be able to get it from me because I don't know how to do portraits or somebody who wants something really simple to not be able to get it from me, you know, because I only do crazy over the top, um, super colorful textured work. I want to be able to handle anything that comes my way. So I don't have just one signature style. I like to be able to do anything that comes my way. And so I want somebody to be able to look at my work and who might be familiar with it to really start to recognize over time as they see more and more pieces. Oh yeah, that does look like a piece that was done by Dylan DeJesus. You know what I mean? I want all of the pieces to eventually have some similarities um, between them. So, sorry, this is a really long answer to that question. You're but, all right, man. But You're my right. process is I like to first have a consultation, you know, with a potential client and really get a feel for what they're trying to have done. And then my process is really just starting to play with things in Photoshop, really just starting to play with, you know, the balance of colors. So for example, if I'm doing a 
I'm a Chicago guy, so if I'm doing a Chicago bear shoe, just really starting to balance out how much navy blue I want to do, how much orange I want to do, get a feel for them. Are they looking for a really loud all orange shoe or are they looking for something more subtle with, you know, a lot more of that navy blue and, um, you know, really just try to get a feel for how loud and over the top I'm going to go because I like to turn the dial all the way up to start and then get feedback from them. Okay, let's turn it down a little bit. But I want the pieces that I do to truly stand out and be something unique. So first I'll let the client sort of tell me, let's tame it down a little. I want something a little more subtle and go from there. So I do start with a, a good general concept of, of I'm really just trying to get a feel for the balance of the overall colors and stuff. Placement of where I might do logos. You know what I mean? Do I want to do something big on the toes when you you know look at the shoes from directly above or if somebody's looking at the shoes from behind you when the two heels are placed together do I want there to be some type of meaning um you know when the shoes are placed side by side just really starting to play for different stuff like that but I think that my style and the the art itself really comes with time and playing with it so even though I I do like to put together a general mock up that just has like a bit of a balance between the colors. I don't always like to stay completely true to it. Sometimes I just like to let, you know, sort of the canvas speak to me or, or let things flow as I actually start to get into the painting and whatnot. From the technical aspects of it, like what kind of paint do you use? Like how do you even do it? Yeah, so there is a brand out in California called Angelus Leather Paint. Uh, excuse me, that's the name of the product. They are just called Angelus. Uh, and they've been around for almost 100 years, really started off with leather dyes and things like that as, you know, um, as shoes have really evolved over time. But shoe dyes, shoe polish and things like that is what they started with. And then they built a paint line over time that works with leather uh, material. And um, I would say, I don't know, 80% of the shoes that I work on are primarily leather. And um, they have a few different additives if you're working on things like fabrics, meshes, prime knits, all of that type of stuff. So, how long does it like? How long will it take you generally? I always compare that in a way to how long does a tattoo take. So it really depends how yeah, complex it, it is. Depends, you know like, what I mean? Uh, uh, generally speaking, usually between twenty to fifty hours for a lot of my pieces. Um, there's probably not a ton of stuff that you see from me that's under ten hours or so. Um, so it is a lengthy process to do, um, to do it right. You know, now will every single one of them be different or do you kind of have like, this is my, this for this, and I might make 10 or 15 or however many of those, or is every single one, you know, like this is one of one every single time. You know, the answer to that one has really changed over time. Nowadays, it's pretty much all one of one, but I've tried every you know, release style on the book. So, hey, I'm going to be releasing 10 of these shoes come uh, September 1st. So everybody who's interested, you know, start marking your calendars and come September 1st, I'm going to be releasing 10. After they sell out, I'm never going to be making them again. Things like that. I've tried it all. And um, now for the last probably five years or so, it's been predominantly just one of one work, unless I'm doing big, you know, corporate orders or things like that, where they're trying to purchase, uh, you know, a lot of the similar style at the same time. How much are you selling them for? Can we, can I just straight up ask you that? Or is that totally? Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. So, you know, kind of like the, uh, a similar answer to how long does it take? There's a, there's a very wide range yeah, yeah. for the most part. Generally speaking, a lot of the shoes are usually going to be between 1500 to 2000 And um, that's for a lot of the one-of-one -one stuff that can take, you know, anywhere from, like we said, 25 to 50 hours. Most expensive one? The most expensive shoe that I've sold would have been, hmm, I think 2400 would have been the most expensive one. Even though that sounds like a lot, but then when you think about it, like, oh, if that's taken you 20, yeah, 40 hours, hours. Like, that's... That, that was, this was a hundred hour pair. Um, so it's, it's really, really hard to look at this on an, on an hourly wage, uh, yeah. type scale as an artist. It's, it's, it's always something that a lot of people like to do because so much of the rest of the world works on an hourly wage. But you really can't always just factor that in as an artist because yeah, it's not ho hopefully, hopefully, what takes you ten hours today down the line, 
you can scale that time in half and start and be able to charge more because that took you a few years to become that much more efficient. So now hopefully your product's even better. Um, but what, what's what's funny about the uh, my response to that is even though I certainly have become more efficient over time, you also start to nitpick yourself 10 yeah. times harder. So y- you have so much more of a trained eye than you do when you're first starting out. So, you know, something that maybe used to take me, let's just say 10 hours, um, let's just call that something simple. Even 10 years ago, now that might still take me 10 hours because I'm nitpicking it so much more. You know what I mean? And, and finding a way to make sure it's a million times more perfect than it was 10 years ago. Um, so it's funny because even though you become more efficient, there's definitely a trade off that you start to nitpick yourself even more. Are you ready for some uh, harder slash listener submitted questions? Let's do it. Easiest pair of shoes to work with, hardest pair of shoes to work with. Ooh, um, easiest pair of shoes to work with would be a pair of Nike Roche Ones, which was a much popular shoe uh, 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 about a half decade ago, like in 2016, 2017, 2018. It was pretty much an all mesh upper and mesh is even easier to paint than leather. So it was just a a really fun silhouette that everybody was working on for a few years. Unfortunately, the shoe just fell out of favor over the last three, four years. So there's just nobody doing them anymore. Um, But had a lot of fun working on those. And hardest shoe to work on would be probably something like a Jordan 4 uh, because it just has a ridiculous amount of materials depending on the colorway that you get. There's such crazy contours of the shoe. It's a it's a fabulous silhouette to do certain themes with, but at the same time, it would be an absolute nightmare for a beginner to start with the shoe like that because of all the different materials, because of how not straightforward it is to just plan out a design. And so it's just a really, really tricky one to do right. Is there a shoe that would be like, oh, I'd love to do that, but it's just too difficult. Like you couldn't, you can't do that with this kind of shoe. I feel like I run into that a lot with Jordan 4s because of the way the shoe is built. There's no large areas to do big logos and things like that. There's just, it's just this shoe that has all of these panels on top of each other and there's even a part for anybody who's not too familiar with the shoes there's something called the wings on the shoe so it's just all these interconnected pieces that really make it a unique silhouette but it's just a a truly tricky one to work on and nail oh i'm looking at it now that does look like it's got all kinds of stuff all over it it's busy it's busy it is busy yeah yeah when did that come out because that looks like an 80s 90s shoe yeah right yep like 89 can i jump aside and say that i think the best shoe of all time is those jordans that had like the black shiny leather on the bottom do you know the space jam ones are those the space jam ones those are the ones that he wore in space jam so that's called the if i'm if i'm right on what you're probably talking about that would be the jordan 11 so that's when he won oh yeah uh, the 72 and 10 bulls, that's the shoe he's wearing during that year. You might be talking about like the bread colorway, which is black and red and white. But the one that he wore in the Space Jam movie was all black with a white midsole and it had like a royal blue jump. What What would you consider to be the best shoe? Like what is your personal favorite shoe? My favorite shoe of all time would be the Jordan 3 in the black cement colorway. So the Jordan 3 is what he wore when he won the slam dunk contest and jumped from the free throw line. So that's a a super iconic shoe for sure. Oh, that is kind of a cool shoe. Mm -hmm. That's, I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong here. I feel like that's the kind of shoe that sneakerheads, is that still a word? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Okay. (laughs) Right. You can see how old I'm getting. Like, do people say stool? Do people still say cool (laughs) beans? Like, is cool beans still good? Um, You're still in. All right. Uh, That looks like the kind of shoe that like sneakerheads would love. But maybe regular people in air quotes like, oh, that's, I don't know if that's totally. my kind of shoe. Totally. It's funny when I got into shoes, you know, and uh, I, I started to look up all the Jordan models and silhouettes and started thinking to myself, you, you sort of hear which ones are popular online. And this is coming from somebody who just 
sort of growing up was just wearing Vans, simpler shoes. But then when I just started to dive into this world, it was interesting how different they were than just, you know, growing up, I didn't, like I said, collect Jordans or anything like that. I had your very basic, simple shoes, your staples. And um, it was so interesting seeing these for the first time because at first glance, when you've never seen anything like it, almost like your response there, that's that's kind of unique. That's that's kind of different. I can see how people that are into sneakers like it. But for your average Joe, that might be sort of a weird looking shoe. That's not something that they would gravitate towards, you know? This leads me into this question. How do you feel about white New Balances that older generations wear? <laughs> oh, man, you got to love them. Whatever, what, built for comfort. You know what I mean? Built for comfort. Whatever works for you and your feet, you know? Do you think that you'll ever hit that age where you just buy the same shoe over and over again? Oh, totally. Totally. A- as I've become a as I've become a, a dad and, uh, you know, just gotten busier with the business and I work from home, there's way less time spent on me worrying about collecting shoes and whatnot. And now it's grab and go and things got to be a lot quicker, so... What's the uh, hardest part of the shoe itself to kind of design? Easiest part of the shoe. The hardest part of the shoe to design, I think I would have to say would be, I think if you're worried about the long-term durability of the shoe, which somebody who's creating a, a wearable piece of art is, the hardest part of the shoe to design would be the areas where it's most likely to crease. And so those are the areas where you're a lot more susceptible to to things like paint chipping and whatnot. So sometimes you need to find the right shoe where you may not need to paint certain areas. You can keep those as part of the factory design and still just sort of interweave your design throughout there. So that would be the hardest part because you have to just really factor that in. That takes away some of the ability to just treat it like a blank canvas. Uh, But the easiest part of the shoe to design... Ah, boy. Easiest part of the shoe to design. I don't know. That's tricky to answer. <laughs> does does it vary a lot by shoe? Like, oh, if you got a Nike, you know you're going to be able to do this here. A Reebok is this here. Adidas is this here. Or is the shoes, like, not that much of a factor? There's, def- there's definitely some, you know, um, similarities across the entire spectrum of things. Certain brands are going to use... Um, higher quality materials, the more expensive shoes you work with are typically, you know, going to be built better in a lot of cases. And so, yeah, I think the hardest part or the the easiest part to design would be, I don't know, the, the, the cop-out answer would be the laces, but that's not really something you have to design, but that's always the, the last step. And, and that's kind of fun to do. What do you have to do with the laces? Do you just dye them? You just get to you get to pick any color you want or dye them if you have a really specific shade of color that you need or I have an entire lace wall over here with thousands of laces so whatever project I'm on I can head on over and I should be able to find something that fits for the given theme. Do people still say what are those? What's your favorite shoe <laughs> insult? Like somebody's got uh, some lame man. shoes, yeah. man. What are you the, saying? The, the what are those was big for was 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 real big for a couple of years there. Um, I feel like that was that was definitely a point in sneaker lore history that uh, it, it'll be hard to top that one. So I think that that one is still that's the first one that comes to my mind when you ask, you know, what's your favorite sneaker insult for sure. <laughs> what, even I got even that got to like my level of like, right. What right, a, that, like it was funny. And the, it was uh, just funny. There was the uh, the damn Daniel one for anybody who's wearing Vans. There was a, a video that went around maybe 2017 ish, and it was a couple kids at high school. And every day he'd go up to his friend and he'd say, "Damn Daniel," and he had he was wearing Vans every day, and that became a uh, something you would say to anybody out on the street wearing Vans. Is there kind of like an untapped? part of the shoe industry in the sense like all right a lot of people doing jordans a lot of people doing vans like is anybody doing crocs or something like that right is there like the next shoe that's going to get this kind of treatment yeah so the hard part about crocs is they're rubber rubber is 
pretty much impossible to paint and keep durable. So unfortunately, there's not a ton of custom painted Crocs where I know Crocs is really uh, the way that they've added their customization is through people adding the charms onto their shoes. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, picking your favorite characters, teams, whatever, uh, little knickknacks that you put on there. So that's what they've done. Um, in terms of other untapped markets, I mean, you know, no shoe, you know, there's there's a slogan that a lot of people say that uh, within my industry that no shoe is safe. You know what I mean? And so every shoe uh, can can head into somebody's cust into somebody's studio and and get get the right treatment. That's a good part of lingo, man. Studio, I like that. Yeah. Celebrity with the best style. Who do you think's like? Ooh, ooh that's the best celebrity sneaker head. I, f I can't say the word sneakerhead. I feel like a poser. It's I, I, the first one that comes to mind just because just for everything he's done has to be Kanye and his impact on the industry. I mean, he got his first Nike deal. Gosh, I don't know what year, maybe 2009, 2010. He released two silhouettes with Nike that were just absolutely ginormous. Then he signed a, a mega deal with Adidas where he's had multiple different shoes and, um, He's somebody who's just had a, a, a huge impact on fashion, sneaker culture. Uh, some other rapid fire celebrities that I know have just had immaculate sneaker game over the years would be the rapper Wale. Um, he probably has one of the craziest sneaker collections ever. Fat Joe, um, DJ Khaled. I mean, he gets his own Jordan colorways. Uh, Jay Balvin has done a lot in the last few years. He's had quite a few different Jordan collabs. So those are some of the, uh, the quick ones that come to mind. All right. So looking at, uh, I pulled up some of your, your Instagram page, looking at some of your shoes. So tell me about these, man. That looks like a lot of work. Yeah. So this was, uh, made for a YouTube video where we have a series called recreating your design. And um, so what we do is we open up the floor for our viewers, subscribers, uh, and just fans of sneakers to design a shoe that then I'll try to recreate. So we had a few hundred entries for this project. And what we did is we set up a, almost like a March Madness style bracket where then our, our, our uh, followers and whatnot could vote on who would be the winner and the winning shoe, I would then try to recreate somebody else's design. So that's why I think this falls in line with what I talked about earlier. Is I like to not have one signature style, but I want to be able to handle anything that comes my way. And I think that this series and this concept behind this piece um, really falls in line with that. So it's somebody else's design to where now I have to get in their head and try to think of how would you bring this design to life. So when I first saw it, the mock-up for this piece, I thought, oh boy, where do you even begin on something yeah. like this? If you just if you just think of this as an all-white shoe, truly, where do you start because of how busy it is and how much color there is and how many stencils are going to go into a piece like this? And so it was uh, really interesting for me to try to reverse engineer things. So I can see the final product, and I know what we're going to be starting with, an all-white shoe. Um, but, you know, what's that journey going to be like? What are the steps we're going to need to take to get there? So it was really challenging but really fun to do. And I think that the end result came out just uh, so amazing, something that I'm so proud of with, uh, with how they turned out. And I love that one of my favorite pieces that I've done was designed by somebody else. But I just had to have the technical know-how to bring it to life. So I think that that's a lot of, you know, what we sort of try to teach to, you know, our students who attend our courses and whatnot. And a lot of the techniques that we talk about on YouTube, really just being flexible and being able to break things down and, and visualize them and, and try to take the right steps to figure out what you're going to do next. Because I think that knowing what it was like being a younger artist, it's easy to want to throw in the towel to have no idea how you're going to do certain things, to look at artists, other artists that you look up to and just constantly think, how do they make this look so easy? You know, 
How, how does everything that they do seems like it comes so natural to them? I know that that was what I was thinking when I was starting out. So it takes a long time to develop a process and to be confident in knowing that you're going to be able to figure something out like this, just seeing the end product. It looks, it reminds me of like saved by the bell inspired totally. fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yep. Yep. Just the nineties, you know, just, just the nineties. Yeah, the you know whether it's the the cups or the you know the decor that you would see in Target or whatnot, just yeah, yeah. just pure nineties nostalgia. You know what I mean? So you're now you're using a stencil on top of the shoe and then painting it, or how does that work? Yeah, so for this piece, a lot of it is stenciling. You know, to get a lot of the shapes and whatnot, um, all of those fun triangles and squares that you'll see, all of that does get stenciled rather than hand painted. Um, I'm somebody who likes to use stencils in my pieces to try to make them as clean and factory looking as possible. And I found that I'm able to get closer to that look using a stencil rather than just freehanding everything. Yeah. Um, like a ton of great artists do, but you know, I'm somebody who likes to use all the tools at my disposal. So I use stencils on a lot of my pieces. Holy crap, man. That is a level of artistic detail that I would not think that you would be able to get onto a shoe. <laughs> yeah. So if there was any shoe where I was, I always like to make the funny joke. If, if aliens were to invade earth, which who knows, and I had to you show them know. a shoe, I had to show them a shoe to impress them. Otherwise they're going to destroy the entire planet. I think this is likely what I would try to show them from my catalog, at least, you know? And, um, it's funny because I'm not somebody who's a uh, avid fan of anime. And this was a part of a gallery in Paris last year where there was eight artists from the USA matched up against eight artists from France in an anime battle. And um, so an artist from the USA was matched up with one from France and they both had to do their take on a given anime. So I was the captain of Team USA and I was matched up with the captain of Team France, and we were given the theme Dragon Ball, and we got to do anything we wanted from the source material. And it was really cool because almost all of the other participants, I think all 16 besides myself, were big anime fans. So I knew that I had to really live up to the task of knocking out a, a piece that was going to live up to what I knew everybody else was going to do since they were such fans of the source material. All of the shoes that they do, they live and breathe, you know, anime style pairs. So this was one where I said, okay, you know, I, I, I can't, I, I can't leave any stone left unturned with what I'm going to do. So to paint four characters on the side of one shoe is at that scale was incredibly time consuming. This was easily a uh, hundred to a hundred. I, I lost count. So a hundred to 150 hour piece probably. And um, so on one shoe, I went with sort of like a good versus evil concept. So on the left shoe here, it's the four different stages of Goku. And then I think on the right shoe, it was four of the uh, sort of the main villains from Dragon oh, Ball yeah. that you could see there. So Frieza, Cell, Majin Buu. And um, yeah, that was uh, that was the theme behind them. How do you keep it? Like, I would think that that canvas necessarily, the shoe... Like when you press down on it, I would think that it'd be moving around on you. How do you? It is. It is. Oh, yeah, totally. Especially because the Jordan 1 has a lot of those different panels and stuff. So it's just getting familiar with holding those every day for years. You know, it's just that ends up being what you're used to working on. I'm more used to working on a surface that moves like that than I am just working on a flat canvas, you know, like a traditional artist. That's really good, man. Like, I don't know anything about sneakers or art, but like, damn. <laughs> like, that Thank looks you. like Thank computerized you. done. You know, like the detail, the way, all that That's stuff. the goal. That's yeah, the goal. It's fucking awesome. Um, so, like, when you, do, when you do, you know, a shoe like this, is it easier to do a more, what I would call, like, a simpler shoe, like a football cleat? Or is this more yeah. difficult? Football cleats are a lot of fun, and it's something that I'm I'm glad I get to work on for uh, a good four or five months of the year. We're super busy with uh, with NFL season, which is quickly approaching here in the fall. And um, what's interesting is the cleat that you have pulled up is something that's all one solid panel. 
And so it's a totally different canvas than if you're working on something, you know, like a, a Jordan 5 that we have here where there's, you know, 12, 10 different panels stretched across the entire shoe. So just the way that you have to go about designing them is totally different. And they end up being, aside from getting familiar with working on the different material, they end up being a little bit easier to work on, in my opinion, since you're working on one, it's not a flat surface all the way around, but one continuous surface. Whereas so much of what you know, people uh, who are into customizing shoes end up working on things like your Air Force Ones, your Jordan Ones. They just have so many different panels where you have to work on each panel separately um, unless you have one continuous design. Cleats present a totally different challenge of it being one continuous surface. So this was made for uh, the NFL's My Cause, My Cleats. That's the one week per year where every player is allowed to wear um a pair with no restrictions and they're meant to be a part of a charity. So this was the uh, boys and girls club of, uh, does it say South Florida? Can't even remember which one. River, this was River region, but that could be like river region. Okay. Gotcha. Any, yeah. Yep. yep. Um, so they pick a charity or an organization that they want to represent. And then we get to do uh, a fun pair of cleats inspired by it. So just a boys and girls club, you know, I thought, back to being a little kid playing with hot wheels and stuff like that. So I thought let's trick them out with some cool flames and do the, uh, the colorway that they had for this boys and girls club. So that's what we have here. So do people actually wear them? Absolutely. I would say, uh, over time, a lot of my pieces have eventually, and just finding that specific clientele, it ends up being people that are, are treating them more as art pieces and they're going to be displayed and things like that. Um, but certainly there's, there's a huge market of people that are into collecting custom shoes and wearing custom shoes. And, uh, that's what a lot of our, you know, our YouTube videos are on how to actually make wearable custom shoes. That's pretty much all the questions we got, man. Is there anything we think we missed or where can people kind of learn more about you? Find out what you're doing. Yeah. So you can check us out on YouTube at De Jesus Custom Footwear. We have, uh, I think, around 225,000-ish subscribers. I think I've done almost 300 videos, uh, tons of behind-the-scenes stuff of what's going on here in the studio, tips and tricks, tutorials. Um, I have a few different series called Reviewing Your Customs, where I'll review other sneaker artist shoes, critique them, give general feedback, things like that. And uh, our Instagram is going to be the same, at DeJesus Custom Footwear. We have a three-day sneaker course that we do here in Chicago called the DCF Experience. We just hosted our fifth one. Uh, our sixth one probably won't be till next spring, if I had to guess as of now. But uh, if anybody's ever interested in learning more about the craft and getting some hands-on training, you could check that out at uh, DeJesusInc.com. Um, what article of clothing are you most sensitive about? Like, oh, I hate it when I get this dirty or when this doesn't fit. You know, I, I'm I'm pretty picky about my shirts. Like, what part of the shirt are you picky about? Cleanliness, fit. What is it? Fit, like because I'm a I'm a bigger guy, especially up top. So, like, you know, if if it's it needs to be a, a comfortable fit, or I'm going to be self conscious out in public. So it needs to be. If coming from a guy who used to wear medium t shirts, though, I also like I don't like. I have to have a certain kind of sock. Can't be like a long sock. It usually has to be an ankle sock. You don't like people to be able to see your socks. No, I don't actually. If if I if I could get away with like wearing socks but not ever having to put them on, like if there was just a sock always on my foot, I'd probably be okay with that. I'm most sensitive, I think, about t shirts. Shirts actually, but specifically the collar of a shirt. I hate a loose collar on a shirt. That drives me nuts. Hate a bad collar on a shirt. I've never understood people that wear clothes with holes and like bacon neck on purpose. If you don't know what bacon neck is, it's essentially what you just described. It looks like a piece of well done bacon, but as a collar. Oh, I don't like bacon neck. Wait a minute, though. If it's just from sweat or if you've been like working in it all day, that's different. But if it's like just, oh, he's got bacon neck and you just put that on, I'm throwing that shirt away. Like, let me put it this way. If if you haven't been working and you have means to buy a shirt that doesn't have a hole in it and doesn't have bacon neck, but you choose to do so, 
you have no respect in my opinion. I have no respect for you because of that. Mm-hmm. What about going to the gym? Because I have several shirts that have holes in them that I wear to the gym. I mean, that's fine. I mean, you're working. Those holes didn't get there by themselves. Or maybe I they mean, did. Well, yeah, I think they kind of did. I don't really ever know how I get holes in shirts. <laughs> It's, it's like always a mystery. Like, how did that happen? I get them in the same spot, the armpit. I'm like, how does this happen? Are my arms rubbing together? Do you think it's just your sweat? Like, there's just so much sweat, it goes through the shirt? <laughs> like, how do you get a hole in the armpit first? I don't know. I actually don't, for a big person uh, or a bigger person, I, don't, I still don't sweat as much as I think I should have. Or I should. Maybe you don't drink enough water. What? Okay, but if you could get rid of one article of clothing entirely, like you would never have to wear this again, what would you get rid of? That's easy. Underwear. You can do that now, though. That's arguably the article of clothing you can get away with, man or woman, not wearing (laughs) right now. I mean, if if you're asking for like a, a, I guess, an essential everyday clothing item that I I, I could get rid of... um, I mean, to be honest, I, I don't really think I need to wear pants all the time. I would get rid of pants. Like, I hate pants. Like I don't like to have my ankle to knee covered generally. I like that flowing out. <laughs> like um, freedom down there. I just, for some reason, I don't have a lot of sensation below my thighs. So I can wear shorts in the winter. Obviously, I wear them in the summer. I just, pants... Uh, I'm just not. I don't know if 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 my boss was to come to me and say, John, you don't have to wear wear pants to work anymore. Uh, you can just come, butt naked or in underwear. Okay. What? I don't understand like why bosses have a problem. Like, oh, those aren't professional. Those are shorts. Like, re- did you think I didn't have legs? Like, they didn't. <laughs> like, what's the big deal? I do think, and this is a rant, so I, I won't go into it. But I do think as business changes. Uh, So is the thought process on, you know, a person going to the office every day doesn't have to wear a three piece suit if you're never going to be doing anything that requires you to wear a suit or 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 entertain or whatever, uh, you know, you do. I think it's kind of the opposite. And I was a person who used to hire people, not like I was a hiring person, like that wasn't my only job, but I was a hiring manager for stuff. And I would always go with the person that kind of looks like they don't give a damn. Because that probably means they're good enough at that job that they don't have to care. <laughs> like, if you show up, like, all in a suit, all that kind of stuff, like, you're probably putting, you know, you're probably a little bit more show than go. I mean, I think it's 50-50. I think, I think uh, some candidates nowadays, if they just get on there and they just literally don't give a shit, they may not actually care. Yeah. I'm okay with that, though, too, right? Like, I think that society as a whole is kind of realizing, like, this is just a job, man. Like, what are you going to do for the – why do you want to work here? Because it gives me a paycheck? Like, I don't care about this company. (laughs) You don't care about me. Let's not pretend like this is something. It's not a relationship, man. It's just a job. Give me money, I give you work. That's how it works. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I could get going on this forever. Although, while I do not like pants that cover the whole leg, I'm a fan of long sleeve long sleeve shirts that cover the whole arm. I like to have my arms covered more than my legs. Uh, I mean, yes, on that. But really, for me, it's just the the upper body and my, you know, pretty much. If you were just to go from my neck to my side boob down to my, you know, my pubic area, like that's it. That's all I need covered. Uh, it's, it's just, God, I really don't want to think about that at all. Also, if you don't have feeling below your knees, like you may need to go to the, <laughs> you may need to check up on some no. diabetes there. My no, I, I have, <laughs> okay. I have you feeling, but like, I, I'm the kind of person that can, I don't know, I can wear uh, a short sleeve t-shirt and shorts in 10 degree weather. And I'm not bad. Like as long as I have gloves on and a hat on and some good shoes or boots, I'm not going to get that cold. Okay. How long do you think you could last in 20-degree weather? Shoes on. You got socks, shorts, long sleeve shirt, and you have gloves. I agree. If I have gloves on, I'm generally – that buys me an extra 10 degrees if my hands are warm. (laughs) How long do you think you could last in 20-degree temperature? Is it day or – Just standing outside. You're not running. You're not doing anything. You're just standing there. Is it day or night? 
20 degrees either way. No. Um, let's – I don't feel like it counts if the sun is shining directly on you because that can buy you a lot of time. I'm going to say it's going to be noon, but it's cloudy. No direct sunlight you feel is hitting your body and warming you. 20 degrees. I mean, I, I, well, just standing there, I'm going to say less than 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. I guess that is actually really pretty cold. <laughs> yeah. it's. I don't know if you know what I would have been impressed with or been like, oh, no way. I really don't know. We probably have had somebody on this podcast in the five years we've been doing it that's done something extreme like that, I'm sure. I like to be cool, but I don't like to be cold. I actually, this past weekend, I was in the sun a lot, and you would never know it. Because uh, I'm learning as I get older that I don't tan. I turn red, and then I go back to pasty. So it is what it is. Um, You're like a brown-haired ginger, really. Coming from, I mean, my brother is a ginger, so that would make sense. Um oh, yeah. Yeah, he's he got the just ginger jeans, but not the look. <laughs> the ginger jeans. Um, you know, fake, gi- fake ginger. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know where I was going with that. I don't even remember at this at this moment. And I just go into shout. Yeah, let's just like... let's just go to where we where we shine by giving people some shiny shout outs. All right, uh, and by the way, my internet is back. You did. I I, I need to give you kudos on. Uh, Peace milling last week's episode. Nobody understands how difficult it is uh, to deal with me on a regular basis like you do. Let alone it's frustrating. It's it's having to. It's quite terrible, honestly. And it's so, it, but the thing is, is that you make it so much worse because you don't. You refuse to listen or learn your lesson. You sound like my wife. Anyways, take the compliment. Last week's episode. You. If you haven't checked it out, you should because that's probably the most effort Nick's put into the podcast, at least editing it. So. Uh, well, well done to you, sir. So here's some, Thank you. Here's some shout outs. Uh, Katie Brown, Tom Wade, Mark Bortz, Nicole Piotro, mm. Lily Mellitz. I like that name, Lily. I like that name, too. Lily's a solid name. Charlie Snow. Charlie's okay. I know most Charlies. I don't know a lot of bad Charlies. If I had a list of, like, top tier, medium, bottom... <laughs> I don't know any bottom tier Charlies in terms of people. I just don't know if I know that many Charlies. Maybe five. I actually don't know. Can't think of a single one. <laughs> now that I think of it, I actually know one. I know one Charlie. He's all right. Just in the middle. He's in the middle. Uh, Greg Josephson, Nadine Chavez, Derek Perendo, and Tracy Green. Y'all get the shout outs of the week. Tracy can be hit or miss. Like it just as the quality of person. Yeah. Tracy's can generally be hit or miss. I found that uh Tracy's with an IE. Fantastic. EY, like this Tracy is, or seems to be, uh pretty good, okay. But if you just have a Y, sometimes it can be borderline. Have you ever had somebody in your contact list is completely the wrong name? Yes, actually. Um, multiple people. One person, I thought his name was something for two years until he told me that's not actually how you say it and that's not how you spell it. But is it a name like it was close enough? Like, no, my name's not Tom. It's Thom. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, similar to that. I mean, I haven't... I was calling him Steve, and his name was Greg. The problem is I I don't, like, remember people's names, but but I, I haven't, like, made that big of an error in my contact list that I know well, that I know. Of. I have put people down as wrong, like, the wrong people. And then when they message me, I'm like, oh, hey, Tony. And he's like, this isn't Tony. This is Steve. Oh. So. What's your how do you How do you have your wife in your phone contact? I think we've talked about this. Okay, but how do you have it? <laughs> Oh, you got it, and there's a nickname, don't you, you pants? <laughs> Do you have her in there as Bubs? It's Wubs, uh, but yes. Oh, sorry. I mean, actually. That's just not, that's not, but you're not thinking ahead, right? You're a parent now. You've got to plan ahead. If you're like, I need somebody to call my wife. Who's his wife? It's under Wubs? I mean. Come on now. you got to plan ahead on this. you got to have government name. I mean, I'm hoping that if if I, if I am in that situation, it does say 
you know, in case of emergency, Melissa Scholl. But, you know, I'm hoping if I'm ever that incapacitated, somebody's like, who's this wubs that he's called 47 times? Man, what if you had like a mistress and they just checked like most recent <laughs> like communications and they called your mistress or something like that? That has to have happened at some point in history. That mm -hmm. has to have happened where they called like the mistress or the what's the male equivalent of a mistress? Mister? Is there a male equivalent of a mistress? There has to be. Mistress? But I don't know what it is. Never heard of this before. A paramour? Oh, like the band. <laughs> no. It's spelled P A R A M O U R. How do you spell the band? I, I, oh, it's a M O R E. Oh, clever, clever. Same word, different spelling. But oh, you also artist. have Sugar Baby, Kept Man, or Toy Boy, or Sugar Daddy as well. So, yeah, but I think those are different than just being a mistress. I think a paramour is probably the male equivalent. Anyway, it's uh, also you have, is that... a master can be masculine while mistress is feminine. But I don't think anyone's going to say, hey, I'm cheating with my master. That just sounds terrible. I think in certain communities, that's a whole other topic, right? Like <laughs> yeah. you're getting into some shit there. You're right. right? Like, well, you know, gets... what if you call that? You call... Just... Uh, I'm actually the uh, what do they call it? The master no i'm not his wife i'm his dominatrix like well can you come down here and pick him up because he's uh he's, 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 he's shit. yeah okay uh all right well uh after last week's technical um challenges we're bringing back profoundly pointless factor fiction <laughs> can we start calling it the <laughs> profoundly pointless factor fiction <laughs> uh, i've, I've fucked up all right <laughs> it's just poof, the poof poof the, let's just call it poof poof the poof, profoundly poof. pointless fact or fiction okay, is that better poof. all right so uh i don't know why i think that's so funny to me it is. so i'm gonna uh if you're if you're just tuning in for the first time in, in a month and a half uh i think people get what fact basically is. give nick four things he hasn't <laughs> he's kind of on a cold streak uh, he hasn't. He hasn't been doing. I too don't well. think that you have any accurate records keeping of what my streak actually is. You were, I think, you were four and zero, four and zero, and then you were like two and two and one and three. So that's that's pretty good. Uh, uh, bat. That's over fifty percent. Four and four. Well, you can fail with fifty percent. Two and two. That's ten. It's eleven. It's eleven out of sixteen. That's pretty good. All right. Well, so, let's. There you go. Let's see if you get this one right. In a group of 23 people, there's more than a 50% chance that two of them share a birthday. True or false? I would say that's probably false. And that is actually correct. Okay. With a group of 57 people, the probability of two people sharing a birthday goes up to 99%. With 57 people? Yeah. I don't know a single other person that has this. I know way more than 57 people, and I don't know a single other person that has the same birthday as I am. I'm going to go ahead and say, I think most people probably know between 500 and 1,000 people have met or known at least 500 to 1,000 people. Would you agree with that statement? Sure. I don't know a single other person who has my birthday. Do you know anybody who shares a birthday with you? Yeah, a coworker. Okay, so one person out of how many? I mean, I uh, maybe other people do. I mean, I, I don't know everyone's birthday off the top of my head. Maybe you should. I guess I don't really know a lot of people's birthday. That's not the kind of thing that I would ever remember, to be honest with you. See? So maybe more people <laughs> share your birthday. I have to legitimately think. I probably only know. I don't know your birthday. September 8th. No. Third. I, oh, that was decently close. Can you guess mine? I have it on my iPhone calendar. You should actually know it. Is it May? No. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Oh, yeah. March 16th. March 16th. Yeah. That's the only reason. Okay. Well, that's why 
I'll never forget it now. I just feel like that's not really true. Like, I understand that mathematically that's probably true, but I think if you had a bunch of people that were all together, like, nobody has the same birthday. All right, well, let's see if you can redeem yourself with this one here. Uh, toilet seats are full of germs. True or false? Well, I mean, what's your, what's your definition of full of? So, well, like, yeah, anything's full of germs. Like, your face is full of germs. I think like anything is full of it. I think it's a I think it's a, a known thing that people are afraid sometimes to use public restrooms because they think they're full of germs. You. You're going to sit down bare cheeks on a public restroom. Am I? Absolutely. Yeah. You go bare cheeks in a public restroom? I mean, it depends where I'm at, but I will. Sure. Even at work. Are you going to do bare cheeks at work? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I go to the nice are bathroom. You s- go to the nicer bathroom. But everybody goes to the nice bathroom. <laughs> I wouldn't go bare. Are you serious? You'll go bare cheeks at work? I let my, my two... Young daughters go bare cheek. I mean, I mean, what what's going to happen? I mean, we when they have to go eight times a uh, a shopping trip. Like, I'm not going to take the time to, you know, protect your children's health and well being. I understand. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that is. I'm not going to take the. T- I'm not going to take the time to look both ways when I cross the street. I look one way and then I just go and hope the other way stops. By the time I get there, well. it's to add to this, the there was a study done by the University of Arizona, which found after uh, and you probably been to some places that they tested the toilet seats at that toilet seats are actually relatively clean compared to normal everyday services that we use every day, including workspaces, kitchen counters and tray tables. Yeah, but I'm not going. I cannot think of a single public place. Not a single one where I would go bare cheeks. Hotel. I guess a hotel would be the only thing where somebody else might be doing that, that I'm going bare cheeks. Okay. If you are not, if the house, if any area is comprised of someone besides a blood relation of mine going there, (laughs) I'm not going bare cheeks. Okay. Let's, the University of Arizona also put this little nugget in the, in this, this story or whatever that. Their study found that cell phones are 10 to 25 times more germy than the dirtiest toilet seat that they that they tested. They're going to talk. They did, where did they test? Did they go to a concert festival in the middle of summer? Because I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say no on that. Well, actually, it's kind of funny. I asked. I, I brought this question up because it, it leads to a story. Okay. Which is gonna gross you out now because I didn't... I don't want to hear it if it's gonna gross me out. Okay, I hate gross stuff. All right, is it that good of a story? Tell me on a scale of one to ten how good the story. Well, is. it has it's to above do... an eight. It has to do with the public restroom and myself. Okay, so I was I was I was going to the bathroom, and I was getting, one or two, uh, a one, and I was okay. Okay. I was I was getting ready to get done. And I had set my phone oh, dude. next to the toilet. And I, like I said, I was getting done doing what you can imagine. And I brought my elbow up, knocking the phone into the toilet. Got the phone out. Little, I didn't even think anything of it. It was still working great. Wasn't until I got home when I realized maybe I should have washed this off with a Lysol wipe. I could, that's an honest to God story. That just happened last week, actually. Where was the, what restroom was it? Where are we talking? Are we talking work? We talk, what, what was the, where was the restroom at? It was, it was a work bathroom. Slightly not so bad. A little bit. Oh, it was. Like if you were like at a Home Depot. Like, bro. Oh, listen, it was terrible. <laughs> I, I washed my face probably 50 times after I realized it's too late now. It was man. too late. I mean, I added up to my ear. I probably had shit flying in my mouth. Like, it was, yeah. But anyways, so just to go along with Did your you story. wash your hands too? Oh, I washed every. I mean, I washed everything. Um, I can't believe you go bare cheeks at work. I wouldn't go bare <laughs> cheeks at a single. That's to me is like, okay, let me give you a list of places and you tell me if you would go bare All cheeks. All my coworkers okay? are, okay, yes. Work. Obviously, yes. Work. Yes to work. 
public library. Yeah. Retail store, but it's a little bit nicer. I'm talking like a Barnes and Noble, Macy's. How about I make this easy? Bit... I'll make this easy for you. There's only a few places. Just tell I, me where you. I won't tell me where you go. Want. Like a truck stop. Yeah. Okay. Uh like I, I I don't know how to put this without offending people, but like uh like a uh, grocery store or uh, a retail store that doesn't keep their bathrooms clean, like where they have the you know it needs to be checked every six hours, and you can tell the last time Bob checked it was three yeah. weeks ago. Oh man, I wouldn't go bare cheek. And uh, stadiums, I will not. Uh, I will not drop it down and go bare cheeks in, in stadiums if. Unless I'm in it with, when no one else is there, which is, you know, never happened. What about an airport? Yeah. I can't. I honestly cannot believe this. That, I mean, to me, is one of the grossest things I've ever heard. I could not I could not go bare cheeks at an airport. I mean. Like, you got to peel yourself off. No, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I've. I, I guess I can rephrase that. I'll go in airports that have nicer bathrooms. Like, no offense to, I don't know, like Atlanta, but I'm not going to, you know, you probably use Atlanta's bathroom. It's too busy. It's too busy. But, like, Detroit, they have a, a very nice bathroom area. Orlando had a very nice bathroom. L.A., like, um, you know, Washington, D.C., probably not going to use their bathrooms because, you know. But also, that doesn't mean I won't in, in airports. I wouldn't go bare cheeks. I go. I don't even know if I'd go less. I don't even think that I would go single, <laughs> single thing, like single toilet cover. I'd probably go double toilet cover anywhere I go. I, I just I, I I don't think once again, kind of like how we started this debate or, or debate this discussion. I don't think there's as many germs on. Even if somebody was to rub their shit all over it, I I think the air kills most things. Like it's going to be disgusting. But I don't know if there's a lot that you can get even that way how many times do you have covid <laughs> <laughs> seems to be a pattern of you getting a like look i don't get sick you get sick every fucking week maybe you should adjust your living <laughs> right like what my way seems to be working i don't know about yours i mean you know it's it is what it is man it is right anyways uh let's see so, <laughs> two out of four here we go let's see uh number three true or false uh, uh, you lose most of your body heat through your head. That's not true. Uh, that is not true. You are correct. Uh, you actually only lose, according to the British Medical Journal, and I hope that that's a reputable medical journal, uh, about 7 to 10%. You lose a lot more uh, through your hands, shoulders, and ankles, which doesn't hmm. also doesn't seem right to me, but... I guess your ankles is why your toes would get cold. Maybe I have no idea. It's probably like a surface area thing. I have no idea. I'm just I, I have no idea. Ankles doesn't seem like just you got, you're just venting it out the ankle. I would I would have <laughs> guessed like armpit or something like that. Yeah, but like, okay. Uh, all of the electricity powering the internet in the entire world. If you were to ball that all that up, would only weigh as much as an apricot. I don't think electricity weighs very much. That seems like something that's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to guess true. It is true, yes. Yeah. How much does an apricot weigh? I mean, electricity, that's probably actually a lot of electricity if you had to do it by weight because you're essentially doing something <laughs> that way. Like you're weighing electrons or whatever. It's just, yeah. It's, it's probably actually a lot. I, I have no idea, but maybe we can get an internet expert <laughs> on here and they can tell us how much the internet actually weighs. Can you tell the difference if some of you blind walked into a grocery store and there was just two bushels sitting there? You can tell the difference between an apricot and a nectarine? No. Apricot and a peach? Maybe. More confident in that than the first one. I think I, actually now that I think of what an apricot looks like, it's fairly easy to tell what they are. But a nectarine and a peach, I don't think that I could tell the difference. I'm like, I'd like a, like... I have to look at it, unless it was one of those fuzzy peaches. You're talking to a guy that spends more time picking out which kind of apple to buy than actually grocery shopping. So, what food, what fruit or vegetable do you think that like? Oh, I know how to pick a good one of those. <laughs> What's your best like? Ooh, I mean John to pick it. He knows how to pick a good this. I'm pretty good at picking out sweet corn, like in the summer. 
pretty good at, at, at getting like good, good ripe pieces of corn that just taste amazing. Mine's watermelon. I can pick a good watermelon. It's not the sound, by the way. For anybody listening, the hollow sound thing is not really true. What you're actually looking for is a uniform greenness, <laughs> a uniform uh, circularity. I don't know. Circ- like, it's got to be kind of, it doesn't have to be completely circular, but it needs to be uniform from the front to the back. And you look for a uniform greenness, and then on the bottom of it, you want it to be pretty yellow and flat. Sure. It's not the sound. It's not the sound. It's not. I mean, the sound plays a role, but people get caught up in the sound, knocking on it. You look like a rookie. I'm just telling you. I see somebody knocking on watermelon and not looking at the colors. I'm going to go ahead and point that out, that that's a person that's a poser and doesn't really know what's going on. So I have one final question about the bathroom discussion. So if you have to drop chow, you're doing it, right? You're just going to layer up the toilet. Yeah, dude, you can't really fight that bodily urge, or I'm going to hover. <laughs> I'm not. My My... I would not set not only my cheeks, but my nothing below my knee is ever touching any sort of public restroom. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I don't, not, I'm not touching it. I've hovered once, and it was maybe the most uncomfortable poop I've ever taken. So it's the only reason I do legs at the gym, <laughs> so I can be built up and strong, so I can hover no matter where I'm at. That's why your calves are immaculate. Yeah, it's great cast, baby. Uh, are you ready for our top five? I am. It should be a fun one. Uh, so our top five is top five worst lines to wait in. What's your number five? So this is my number five. I think it would be most women's number one or number two, but because I'm a man, uh, my number five is going to be like bar bar, uh, bar bathrooms, like waiting in the line at a bar to go to the bathroom or a club. Oh, I could see some, but there's some people, right? Like, and if this was your hustle, this was your hustle. But there was some people that would kind of hang out by the bathroom line because there's a little bit of a captive audience. (laughs) Yeah. That used to be a strategy that some people would employ. (laughs) My number five is also a bathroom, but it's specifically an airport bathroom. Okay. Because if there's a line in the early morning, like, I just don't like the idea of, like, I know what you just did, and I'm going to go in there to do that, and there's three other people who are in line ahead of me that also just did that. I'm not messing with that. And you're going to go bare cheeks in there. When there's a line six or seven deep to go to the one stall where everybody's doing that, and you're just going to walk in there and go bare cheeks after it? I mean, obviously, if it looks like it needs a little dusting, I'm going to dust it up. But if it looks fine and it's relatively clean, sure, I'll drop trial and do my business. I Now, but wait a minute. Is this really a thing that, like, look, I really don't think that this is that big of a public health issue. I'm really not worried about germs. You're just being lazy. No, I'm just, I'm just not, not that worried about germs. I mean, this is going to sound really gross to a lot of people, uh, but for the— For the longest time, I never washed my hands after going to the bathroom until I was old enough to realize, you know, some of the germs that you can give yourself if you don't wash your hands. Oh, I don't really wash my hands if I go number one. I mean, I know I'm I'm an adult. I know how not to pee on my own hands. That's just because you don't need assistance. It's just anyways. Right. (laughs) I don't know where you're going with that one. But, okay, what's your number four? <laughs> you know what? I don't really know where I was going with that one either. Uh, airport security. Or really. That's your number four? Really any. I was trying to find a way to, like, wrap it. It's really any kind of, like, getting into an event. But, like, air, like airport security. So, really waiting to get into an event. Uh, going through security, I guess. Because it doesn't matter. If you, you know, no one wants to do it for one. And then, you know, it's just, you, you get nervous. Everyone, you know, if you say you're not nervous going through security, you're, you're a fraud. Because you're always like, is the thing going to go off? Do I have to take off my belt buckle? You know, if, if you're in an airport, like you could get, you can miss your flight. If they detain you for further questioning, like it's just nervous. I always feel like that when I have to, like I went through customs today because I was heading back from Canada. And I legitimately kind of wondered if like. I hope there's no, like, is there, is there cocaine in the car? Is there, like, <laughs> do I, I don't think I got anything, right? But as you never know, yeah, right? You might yeah. have had a long night one night and not realize what you did. Uh, my number four is a theme park. <laughs> I hate waiting in line at a theme park. 
Um, it's a it's a forty five minute wait for a forty five second ride. I hate a theme park line. So I, I have never worth never worth it. I agree with you so much, in fact, that I have it way further up on the list. Mm. Uh, my... That is probably the lowest return on investment line weight that you could ever imagine is a theme park ride. No, I actually my number three I think may be worse in terms of inv- return of investment. But I have uh, any kind of like holiday shopping lines or Black Friday lines. So really, holiday shopping lines. I I I I don't really shop brick and mortar much anymore. Uh, but I, I would never wait in those lines. Best part was being with my father, who would get really angry, make a scene, and then we would storm out of those stores. Because he had to wait in the line. Didn't you see the line ahead of him? Of course, but you like, know that's a lot. A line is never a surprise. Like you know what you're getting into. Like <laughs> well, you know, what are you gonna do? Okay, well. it's just for one. I think it's ridiculous, and two, most of those things now you can just buy online, maybe cheaper than waiting outside in ten degree weather. Yeah, I don't do any of that. I'm not buying anything in a store yeah. on any of those holidays. My number three, I think, is going to be underrated. But my number three is a gas station line to get gas because it's always a little bit unclear who's next. Somebody might be backing in. Somebody might be pulling through. And you might not know that somebody else is in line. <laughs> like, that is the line that is the least like a line. But it's a pain in the ass. you got to get the right side. you got to get the right car. You don't know. Like, that's a crapshoot. Yeah, so my uh, my my number two is kind of like that. Uh, it's like a like a restaurant, like a like an ice cream shop or a fast food line. Like you know, you wait and you wait and you wait. It's kind of like the gas station, and you're like, why am I waiting here? I just it may you know, but you wait. My number two is like the uh, a bar line when you're okay. just up at the bar and it's never clear. Like, well, who's next? Who's, whose oh, turn man. is it? You There's just, no line, really. You just got to take it, though, right? You just got to do it. Like, you just got to go and just just take ownership of that line. That's not actually my number two, now that I realize it. My number two is the DMV. Oof. Waiting for – and I could expand that to any sort of public line, any sort of public service line, like going to the DMV, yeah. utilities, driver's license, yeah, well, sign up for the water heat. What any kind of like public service line? Thankfully, now at least in Michigan, you can schedule ahead of time, so you don't have to wait in those lines. But yeah, back in the day when computers weren't a thing, you would wait hours just waiting there with the rest of the world. It's terrible. Are you number two? Or are you number one? I'm number one. Which, if you've been listening to this, you know my number one is going to be theme park rides. Yeah, it's that's just pretty bad. It's terrible because most of the theme parks are in warm places. So not only are you, you know, are you sweating like a pig? Like if you go to Disney World, that's a two hour wait to ride the teacups. I mean, give me a break. And you do it anyways. What's the longest you've ever waited in a line? Oh, I mean, probably an hour. For a theme park? Oh, theme! I waited four plus hours to ride a uh, roller coaster at Cedar Point one time in Ohio. That sounds awful. That sounds. Was it worth it? A minute thirty. No, if you think about it, it's no. I mean, I you could have ridden you could have ridden twelve other rides, and instead you waited for you know a buck thirty. At the time, it was great, but when you look at it, it's like, what was I doing? My number one is airport anything. Every line at the airport is awful. From the check-in line, the baggage line, the TSA line, the line to get on the plane, the line to get off the plane, everything at the airport is awful. But if I had to pick a specific part, a specific area, or a specific line at the airport, it would be the customer service line after everybody's (laughs) flight gets canceled. Because it's just like, you're fucked. How fucked are you? Yeah. See, and I haven't really experienced that. Actually, every time I've flown so far has been fine service. Um, but I've seen it, and that that could easily be top five for me. Now, I'm going to put it on my honorable mention just because I haven't really experienced the whole uh, you know flight cancellation line yet, but I'm sure I will sooner than later. What, how have you not had a canceled flight yet in your life? Never. I've had, not, had, not have had one 
in my entire life. You've never, not even a delayed flight? I've had a delayed flight, but not one to where, like, they come over, come over the intercom and I was like, flight 2001 is canceled. Oh, that's the worst feeling, man. And, I, and I've flown in the winter. I mean, I've flown, you know, I've, in, in bad weather. I don't know. Just, yeah. Maybe that's the secret, going bare cheeks at places. I make... You get sick a lot, but your airport, airport line doesn't get screwed you up. You hear this voice, you're not going to hear it this way next week. I'm going to have a sniffle or a cold or something. I don't know. It's your flight's on time. What's in your honorable mention? Not that many things. Um, so I, I have, I have like, bathroom lines just in general, like sporting events, which we kind of already talked about. Uh, the DMV was on there. Uh, I also have... And this this is old school, but like toy store lines, like when you would go to a toy store as a kid and you were so excited to get get your toy and then you'd realize you have to wait in line for 30 minutes before you could open it. It's just a just just defeating. Uh, I don't have a lot in my honorable mention, but I have rental car, okay. rental car waiting for a rental car is bad. A pharmacy waiting in line at a pharmacy to me is <laughs> awful. Yeah. It's like, is it going to be ready? How much is this going to cost me? Is insurance paying for it? Why is this person ahead of me asking 50,000 questions like this person is a doctor? Like, well, what I mean, do I take for my knee? I don't know, dude. Pick up your prescription. I do. I do. I will add uh, hospital, like, waiting room lines, like ER room lines, though I know, you know, they're moving at their own like, pace. But, I mean, if you— The only thing is I would say that's not really a line. No, but you I mean— like stand in there. Yeah, but you go in there with your finger cut off, and you have to wait an hour because— Johnny Brown next to you is having a heart attack. Come on. Yeah, that's weird how they just, you know, do it based on priority, right? And like, <laughs> look, man, I got a really bad headache. Well, he's been shot 20 times, so we're going to take care of him first. Take care of me. <laughs> Help me. Um, Is there any good line? Do you have any good line? Like, well, I'm waiting in line for this. Cocaine? <laughs> 